Sources of Funding, prepared for and presented at the 2014 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm excited to talk to you about sources of funding and um, I think building off some of the topics that we've heard from the other speakers tonight. So um, if you have questions, stop me, interrupt me. Uh, this should be interactive. So you heard my bio. Um, basically, in a nutshell, what I do for Cultivation Capital is I manage our technology fund investments. We have two technology funds. One um, started in 2012. Uh, it, it's in the third year of the fund. We have 14 investments in that fund, and the next two years, of that fund will be reserved for follow-on funding in those companies. So we are raising another fund um, that is in the process of being raised right now. It's, uh, we're raising up to $40 million for that fund, and we will deploy that into technology companies across the Midwest. Our focus is really, uh, we have a health healthcare and IT company, and then we have a, or a healthcare and IT fund, and then a technology fund, now two technology funds. Um, our, our focus is looking at this pre-Series A funding gap. So we've looked at uh, companies all across the Midwest. We found that they were able to raise early stage capital, uh, but when it came to getting that next round of traction, getting off the ground, um, getting the capital that they needed to get to the next step, there was this huge funding gap really across most of the Midwest. So these companies would have to go to the coasts or um, leave St. Louis to try and find that funding. So that's why funds like Cultivation Capital started up, and there's several other funds like us in different cities across the Midwest trying to solve that funding gap. Um, so we picked two verticals, technology and life sciences, and we invest in that post-seed pre-Series A space. Um, and so today, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Cultivation Capital, where we fit into the funding cycle, what a company going through funding in St. Louis, what that funding life cycle looks like, um, an intro to angel investors, where to find them, an intro to venture capital, how to get that money, how to pitch, how not to blow it, and uh, what do investors want. So we'll get through that and uh, hopefully get you out of here before you get bored of me. <laughs> okay, so like I said, we are a pre-Series A post-seed fund. So when I say that, uh, it sounds like sometimes when people are talking about this um, that they rattle off terms and they sound smart and you just want to stop and ask them, what do you actually mean by that? So this is a breakdown of what we're talking. Seed funding is probably where a lot of you are right now. You're putting it on your credit card. Um, you're asking your wealthy uncle, um, which might make Thanksgiving awkward depending on how things are going. Um, <laughs> You're asking you know, wealthy individuals. That's where you're, you're building up your proof of concept and you need the seed funding in order to do that. So in St. Louis, we've estimated right now, give or take, and this is a couple years ago, I think we've seen more and more companies fall into this space, but probably you're seeing 500 to 1,000 companies that we would say fit into this space in St. Louis. Then the startup round, um, you're getting a little bit more traction. You're getting a little bit more serious. You've got a product. You've got maybe a little bit of revenue. Um, you've got some proof of concept. So that space, you might be raising fifty to 250000 That's really trying to get a little bit more momentum generated. And that's where we see in St. Louis, friends and family, angels, capital innovators, arch grants. Um, so that's kind of the next step. And in St. Louis, we think that there's about 100 to 200 companies in that space. Then the pre-A pre round, that's where we come in. Uh, so we are raising rounds that are somewhere in the range of 250,000 to 3 million. And that's where you'll see Archangels play, Billiken Angels play, Cultivation Capital, um, to, to some extent, Biogenerator. And we think that there's about 25 to 50 opportunities like this every year in St. Louis. Um, and then the A round, are the companies who are raising more than three million. And yes, they can play in St. Louis. Yes, they can get some funding here in St. Louis, but a lot of times they're looking for opportunities that might be in Chicago, um, the coasts. So we think that there are probably three or four right now, maybe 10 uh, 
companies in St. Louis that fit into this funding space. Um, and our goal is to eventually, you know, once we've built up enough of a, uh, a funding pipeline in the pre-A round is to go and, and build something in the A round, um, but that kind of, we're getting there. Go ahead. You mentioned a, a little description about seed round and startup, like seed round and proof of concept, startup, they have a little bit of revenue and try to get momentum going. What short summary or description would you say for pre-round, what are they in? Pre-A? Pre-A. So um, for the, what we look for is we look for product revenue traction and a really strong team. So we want to see that there's somebody out there who's willing to buy what you're selling, that it's a, um, a strong market, um, that, that people are willing to pay and continue to pay and continue to potentially pay more. And then um, for us, you heard how difficult it is to value a company. For us, we found that one of the biggest things um, that, that shows the success of our investments is the team. So we're really investing in the team. You heard about it on Shark Tank. Um, if, if you aren't coachable, if you don't work well with your VC or your investor, it's gonna be lose-lose for both. So it's, it's a dating process and you're gonna be dating for a long time, so you don't wanna mess it up. So that's why we put such a heavy emphasis on, on team. And, and you'll actually find um, that some sophisticated investors, venture capitalists, private equity, will put you through a battery of personality tests to see just how you operate and how they might operate with you, especially if they're going to take a board seat or take a more hands-on approach. Um, they want to know that you're coachable if they're going to put your, their money to work and, and really get their hands dirty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and green perhaps was not the best <coughs> choice, but you have this in front of you. So uh, if we were looking at what this looks like for a company like yours in St. Louis, this isn't the path that everybody has to go to, but this is a lot of the deals that we're seeing. This is how we're seeing them come to us. So first, a lot of you were there, the friends and family around, putting it on your credit card. Maybe you have enough uh, revenue or enough collateral that you're able to get a line of credit. Um, we don't see a lot of that because we're dealing with technology companies and um, it's very difficult to get a line of credit with those companies. So then angel, angel investors and in St. Louis you have an incredible opportunity with the Arch Grants program. Has everybody heard of Arch Grants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. If you are considering applying, apply. It's, it's probably the thing that has taken the startup ecosystem in St. Louis to the next level. It's, it's a game changer and has put St. Louis on the map. So you've got Archangels, um, you've got Billiton Angels, you've got Arch Grants, um, and then you've got high net worth individuals. Those are generally hard to track down and get them to write checks. Um, so networking helps, um, but it's, it's easier to get to those people through their existing networks like Archangel, or Archangels and uh, Billiken Angels. So are you familiar with the process of how you would get in front of Billiken Angels or Arch Angels? So Arch Angels, um, I can speak to that, um, they have a screening committee every, every month and they listen to, they, they get proposals and pitches from you know, dozens of companies every month and they narrow it down to four or five and they bring in those companies to pitch to their screening committee. That screening committee chooses which companies will actually go in front of the general body of Archangels members. And then the Archangels members listen to those pitches. They vote, yes, they're interested. No, I'm kind of interested. I'm not at all interested. Or I think this is a terrible company. Um, and then based upon that interest, we actually at Cultivation Capital work with them and provide due diligence on the companies that they're interested in. Um, and then if they're interested, um, you might have one or two investors who might write you a $25,000 check or a $50,000 check. They don't invest through a fund. They don't raise a fund itself. They just go out and um, individual investors, if they want to write you a check, they will. Um, but there's no, we're raising a $40 million fund as the Archangels. We're going to deploy our investment through that. It's just individual. Um, can you <clears throat> perhaps tell us a little bit, uh, for instance, if someone applies for uh, capital innovators mm -hmm. and they are not selected, mm -hmm. um, in your opinion or your experience, 
uh, per perhaps the company was did not show enough revenue or the team wasn't intact. Um, is there any prejudice in reapplying? No. In fact, I can tell you we have one company that um, that is in our portfolio now and four years ago when we saw them, well, uh, three years ago I guess, when we saw them we had you know people saying they will never get an investment from us <laughs> where they were and they've applied, they were just almost like cockroaches, they just didn't get <laughs> up. Um, and so uh, it takes that tenacity and it takes being able to reinvent yourself. Um, I will say I had a conversation with a company today that was a finalist for Arch Grants um, and they said from their perspective they were frustrated because they didn't win and for them they felt like it's, it was hard having it be part of their story that they were a finalist but they didn't win. But they've used that to kind of talk about a pivot and to bring traction to um, the, the new direction that they're going in and they, they turn that negative into a positive. So there is a perception from, you know, I think she felt firsthand that it, it could potentially be negative. Um, and, and speaking about that, um, uh, I, pivoting is a very funny thing and um, if you go through one of these programs, how much is it expected that you do pivot? Or is there an expectation? I don't, I don't know that there's an expectation. I know that in hindsight, looking back at the companies, we view um, Capital Innovators, 630, Yield Labs, the Prosper Accelerator, we view those as incredible resources at, at Cultivation Capital because it's essentially a three month due diligence, due diligence program for us because we can watch the company, you know, I, I take a meeting with all of the companies at the beginning of that process and then at the end and I can see how much growth and development they've had through that process. Um, I don't know that the expectation is that you pivot. I think it's easier and you get more out of them if you don't pivot um, because they can take you from here to here instead of from here to here to here. Um, but looking back, I, I think it happens more often than they would like, you know, but I, and, and the companies that I do see pivot in these accelerators are still successful. We've still invested in companies that have pivoted in the future. The nice thing that these accelerators do is they give you access to people with really great perspectives, um, really great connections, really great experience, and so they can take that experience, that perspective, those connections, and maybe open your eyes to a, a business segment or a vertical or a strategy that you hadn't seen, and that might create the need for a pivot. Pivot, I think, sometimes gets a bad rap, the word pivot, uh, especially in this community, but um, I don't think it should. Well, I certainly don't look at it as a negative. For me, it, it makes me realize that you're tenacious, that you're not giving up, you've got passion for your idea, you're going to find the best, most successful opportunity to take your company to the next level. So that brings us to the accelerators uh, piece. Uh, 630 Capital Innovators Prosper and Yield Lab. Yield Lab are the four in St. Louis. Um, you probably haven't heard a whole lot yet about Prosper and Yield Lab because they just started this year. If you have an ag tech, agricultural technology uh, excel, or company, you would be a fit for the Yield Lab. Um, that is an uh, accelerator that Cultivation Capital has helped to launch. Um, so we'll be running all the back office for that. And then Prosper, if you are a woman in here, which I'm really excited to see so many women here. Um, not that I don't love all you men. Um, <laughs> but this is specifically geared towards helping women-led businesses. And, and it's not philanthropy, this is an investment. These are $50,000 equity investments in women-led companies in the areas of life sciences, technology, and consumer products. It's got a rock star mentor team, Maxine Clark, who started Build-A-Bear, Mary Jo Gorman, who started a company called Advance ICU Care, uh, Carol Matthews, who started what became Fantasy Sports, um, and uh, Peter Finley, who is, has a, a huge, huge history in uh, private equity. So Rockstar team, and then Jennifer Elin, who is at Thompson Street Capital Partners. 630 is, uh, if you've got a financial technology company, that's where you wanna be. You'll be meeting with um, the guys who started Lenders One, those are some of the mentors there, and then Jim McKelvey, who started Square. Uh, pretty cool access and incredible opportunities with what's going on in St. Louis in the financial services area. And then Capital Innovators was named the number six accelerator in the country. 
Um, so those are all avenues for um, equity or for investment through accelerators. There are a lot of other programs that you can take part in that are not um, giving you cash, um, but these are the, the big four that we view as cash programs as a way to, go ahead. Sorry, what does Capital and Innovators, what, what's their technology? technology. Yep. And they, um, yeah, they're, Judy Syndicus runs that accelerator and does an incredible job. Um, accelerators are, are judged based upon their ability to um, A, keep companies in business, accelerate companies, have those companies create more jobs, have those companies raise follow-on funding, and have those companies exit. And based upon those metrics, um, Capital Innovators was ranked the number six accelerator in the world. So like I said, Cultivation Capital, um, we view those accelerators as a great opportunity for us to deal source. We see companies go through there, um, we can look at the companies, we can chart their growth, we can get involved, we can help mentor. Um, so we really, we really, really like working with the accelerators. Biogenerator and MTC are kind of opportunities that you might have. Um, Biogenerator is actually two doors down, I think, unless anything's changed with construction. Okay, <coughs> two doors down. Um, so we've invested alongside uh, that organization on our life sciences fund, um, Missouri Technology, uh, Missouri, what is it? Corporation? Corporation. Yeah, okay. okay. Brain. Uh, so uh, has anybody gotten money through MTC? Do you want to talk about the process of? Uh, we got seed funding and it starts with a very long business application and a month of business plan and then you present in a kind of presentation meeting. And they do, um, they do follow on opportunities. So we have a couple of companies in our portfolio who got initial MTC funding and then have gotten follow on funding. Um, so they're kind of angels and grants through the early stage VC space. Um, and then later stage VCs. So when we invest in a company, um, one of the biggest risks, and we'll talk about this, is, is follow on funding. So we wanna make sure that if we give you $500,000 that when you go to raise that next two million, that there's gonna be other people who are willing to invest in you. Otherwise you're gonna die and we've just lost our money. Um, so we work to build out partnerships with VCs across the Midwest. I have great relationships with probably 40 VCs um, in the Midwest and we throw deals around and we talk about deals and we make introductions and uh, look to syndicate on deals. So we do that on kind of the earlier stage and then the later stage, we're, we're working with a lot of firms out of Chicago. That's where we see, you know, when you're looking to raise a $2 million, $3 million, $4 million round. Um, and then as you look to raise a $25 million, $100 million round, those investors are typically in your bigger cities. You might have them in Houston, San Francisco, uh, New York, not a whole lot here, um, but we're hopeful that we'll be there soon. Uh, and then the exit, the important exit. So when you take money from an investor, they're looking to get that money back at some point and then some. So that comes in the form of either a recapitalization, um, an investment, uh, let's say a VC out of San Francisco might want to come in for the next round of funding and they will buy out the existing investors and so those investors will get their money back at a premium. Um, or they, that company can get bought out by a strategic investor. So if I had uh, a boutique shoe company that I had been building up, um, I might get bought up by Zappos. That would be a strategic investor. Or IPO, you've seen the billion dollar IPOs. Obviously those are pretty, um, in, the, in this, the, the likelihood of things happening, your IPO is probably not all that likely, but it's definitely on the spectrum. Okay, so angel investors. Do you know what an angel investor is? Basically someone with a lot of money. Those are the actual <laughs> definitions. Um, you've got to basically have over a million dollars in assets uh, or make 200 to 300,000, depending on if you're an individual or a spouse, and have the expectation of making that much next year. So. The, the popularity of investing in this alternative asset class is um, increasing. So your money managers, if you have this much money, will tell you that you should be investing a, a good chunk of your money in, this alter or in some alternative investments. 
um, as a venture capital fund, we think that alternative investment should be us. Um, so you go out fundraising. We as a fund also have to go out fundraising. So those are some of the conversations that we have. Um, so the good news is, is that angel investors are getting more and more comfortable with investing in what some would perceive as riskier investments because there's no real open market for whatever company you have right now. Um, the harder thing is that they're hard to find, like we talked about. So you know, where do you find them? Your friends and family can get awkward really quickly, especially if things aren't going so well. Um, individuals, you know, the, the people who have a lot of money aren't out there telling you that they have a lot of money and that they want to write checks. So there's a, is everybody, is anybody familiar with AngelList? If you get a chance, go on to angellist.com or co, it, it might be co, Google AngelList. Um, AngelList started basically, um, it's a database of all startups and if you're not on there, you should, you should put your startup on there because as a venture fund, um, I search angel list when I'm looking for information on startups. So it's a database of startups. It charts how much money you've raised, who your investors are, what the news about your company is, but also it's a place for investors to go and, and investors can go and say, I'm an investor in this, I'm an investor in this, I'm an investor in this. But now there's an opportunity for um, startups to raise money directly on AngelList. So investors can go and basically shop startups on there um, and invest through AngelList. So if you haven't played around with AngelList, I would <coughs> familiarize yourself with it. It's worth a shot. Um, I can't guarantee it'll be great, but worth trying. And then we talked about the networks, angels, uh, archangels, Billiken angels. Golden Seeds, uh, Prosper, we talked about, has the accelerator. They are partnering with Golden Seeds, which is um, an, a women-led angel group out of New York. So their goal is to create a uh, angel group that is focused on investing in women-led companies. So they're going to be partnering with Golden Seeds to do so. So there will be opportunities if you're a woman leading a business um, that you can have another opportunity for funding. So that's not off the ground yet, but coming in the next six months. So venture capital, and you know, you've heard it described as vulture capital. Some of the cartoons that uh, Michelle showed you aren't all that off. Um, I think the kindest thing a venture capital firm can do is give you a quick no. If we're not invest, or if we're not interested, I'll tell you we're not interested um, because I think it's really mean to string you along and make you send us updates and updates and updates and updates just to blow you off later. Um, so regional, um, a lot of cities like St. Louis are, are developing you know, their regional VCs that are focusing on investing in that area. Cultivation Capital is that VC for St. Louis. Um, you have in Omaha, you've got Dundee Venture Capital, you've got Cincy Tech, those companies um, just primarily invest in, in the region. We do invest outside of St. Louis, but they do have some sort of regional focus. So um, if you have ties to other cities um, that might be looking, interested in looking to see if there's a, a regional focused VC there. Um, you have a lot of, there's a new trend, well not a new trend, but one of the trends in venture capital is investing in seed stage investments. So you have you know, the big guns out there, the Kleiner, Perkins, um, the, the Andreessen Horowitz who are you know, writing really, really, really big checks. Uh, but there's this new kind of class or I guess increasing in popularity, class that's increasing in popularity of seed, seed stage VCs that are writing much smaller checks, um, trying to get in at you know, two to five million dollar valuation so that if that company makes a 30, 000, or $30 million exit, um, it's much easier to get to a 10x return on their money if you got in at 2 million than it is at 20 million. So that's kind of the thought process there. And then there are industry venture funds like Google Ventures, Intel Ventures, and those are arms of existing corporations who are looking to try and um, either invest strategically in products or companies that they think might have some sort of benefit to their company. Um, currently or in the future. So that's kind of an overview of venture capital. Um, so what's it like to work with us? 
it's not as painful as you might have thought. Um, but this is, if you're a, a company in St. Louis, this is what it looks like for you to go through the process. So I look at 20 to 30 deals a month. Um, of those, two to three get talked about with our partners um, and make it to the next round. So if there's some partner uh, interest, then we do a light due diligence, and that's probably one to two a month. Um, if something makes light due diligence and we still like it, then there's significant interest. So we have a diligence team um, that actually we have a call on tonight, so I may have to jet um, a little sooner. Um, well, not sooner, but we, we have a call every Tuesday night and we spend about an hour and a half talking about the opportunities that we're working on. We have our next investment committee meeting in a month, so we're doing um, 30 to 40 page diligence reports on those companies that we'll present to our investment committee. I don't think any, of, I, I know two of our investment committee meeting members who read every single word, sentence, period in those reports. And then I know some of our investment committee me members who skim the highlight page and call it a day. So we do a lot of work, a lot of diligence. Um, it all depends on who's reading it as to how that's digested. So of those, uh, we have two to three a quarter who are actually get that really big due diligence package done on them. Um, investment, I think eight to 10 a year is high. It's probably more like five to eight a year that we'll invest in. Um, our model is that we take a board seat, we get our hands dirty, uh, we work with the companies, we meet with them on a weekly basis, we really get involved and try and help to guide and mentor the company as best we can. And then when you're ready to raise your next round, we we reserve money to invest into your follow-on rounds, and then we help you find strategic investors and syndication partners to help fill out your rounds. And then um, when it comes time to exit, we're really happy, and we help you find strategic investors. We help you engage investment bankers if need be, um, and we help you um, kind of through that process. So that's what it looks like if all goes well for a company. But you can see that the odds of making it to exit are pretty low. Hi. Um, so um, I don't know. Is that is that my like curtain call? Okay. Um, so uh, what do investors want? Basically, I talked about it. You know, we want to see traction. We want to see that you have a rock star team and that you're hungry. That you're super passionate about what you're doing. Um, if you're not so passionate, we don't care because you're going to lose interest and we've already lost interest. Um, we also, it, it's good to stick up for your company, to, um, to, to be strong, to, um, to believe in it, but it's also important to listen um, and to be able to take constructive criticism. It's also important to know what criticism to smile and nod at and what to ignore. Um, because sometimes you'll hear, you know, everybody's got ideas on how you should run your company. Um, you should listen to all of it graciously. Um, you should thank whomever is, is giving you that advice. And then you should think really strongly about what is actually worth implementing and what is worth ignoring. For us, we want to see a significant market size. We want to see, we're investing in highly scalable companies. So we want to see that you go from, you know, $2 million uh, valuation to a $200 million valuation. Well, if the market size, if the entire market is only worth $50 million, then that's probably hard to do. So we want to see significant market sizes, and we want to see that this is a growing market, not a dying market. So if you were trying to get me to invest in the CD um, player market, probably not going to happen, um, unless you know something I don't about some new cool technology, which is possible. Um, and then follow-on funding. I think this is a big risk, especially on the life sciences side um, that we see every day. So, you know, the, the amounts of money that our life sciences companies have to raise in order to make it to um, profitability to get to that exit is hundreds of millions of dollars potentially. Um, and there's a, a huge risk that they're not going to raise that money and that they're going to fall on their face. So um, we have to think about that. So when we look at an investment, we have to say, okay, well, who potentially could be in, in, in interested in investing in that next round? So those are the four big criteria that we look at and what we want. Um, how to nail your pitch. 
know your audience. If you're pitching to you know, cultivation capital, know who's in our portfolio and what synergies might be there if you know what companies that I might have led a deal on. Bring up some sort of connection to your company or, or know something that might pique my interest. Um, and don't, I mean, you don't have to make a completely different deck for every single investor. Just do your homework and find a little bit about, um, I'm, I'm continuously surprised at the companies that do this and do this well because I remember them a lot more than I remember the companies that are just giving me their generic pitch. Uh, prove that you know your stuff. I want to know that you're an expert in your field. I might not know everything about urban planning technology, but I hope that you do, and I want to know that you know your stuff um, and that, that you've got the credentials to, to implement your, your solution and, and your company and take it to the next level. I think this really sets for me, if I see, uh-huh. So, <clears throat> as entrepreneurs, I think we self-teach ourselves a lot. Yeah. And how, as an investor, do you see that? That's okay. I just want to know, I mean, I don't care that you, you didn't, I don't need to know that you went to Harvard and studied, um, you know, entrepreneurship or urban planning or whatever. I just need to know that you know what you're talking about and you, you read, you know, all the blogs and you're up to date in the industry and you can... And you can prove that by, you know, being, when you're talking, um, you know, talking about current trends in the industry. I had a call with a company today and I brought up one of the competitors and they were able to go through all of the competitors in the market, talk about a headline that had happened that day um, with somebody in the market, um, and then talk about, you know, a couple industry trends that were really on point. So for me, I knew that this guy knew his market cold. Um, KPIs, have you talked at all about KPIs? KPIs um, are, are basically the metrics by which your, your business ticks. So if you are um, a, cupcake sh a cupcake shop, um, there are certain things by which you can gauge the success of your, um, your business. Number of cupcakes sold, um, the number of people who come in the door, the average cupcake order, um, those are, you know, you can track those numbers month by month and you should see increases in them, you know, month by month as you continue to grow. And if you don't see increases in those, then you should see probably problems in your business. So all of our companies, we ask them to track KPIs. So maybe it's unique visitors per month to your website. Maybe it's assets under management for a financial technology company. Maybe it's um, uh, clicks or revenue. Um, know what the key performance indicators are for your business and start tracking them right now. Um, and then when you talk to an investor, share those KPIs and say, hey, look, our KPIs have been growing 20% month over month or 12% month over month. It makes you look a lot more sophisticated and it, it makes it easier on the investor because they know exactly what to look at to be able to judge the growth of your business. Um, don't, yep. Using KPIs as a term in your description is recommended. Our KPIs are, um, we've been tracking our KPIs. Yep. We include that in the dialogue. Yeah. Okay. Yep, definitely. Um, keep it interesting. Be passionate. I mean, obviously, if you are here listening to us talk until 9 o'clock at night, if you're passionate about what you're doing, share that passion. Make your deck interesting. Make it exciting. You know a lot about your business, um, and you can probably get into such detail that it might even bore you. Um, be, be respective of that. Um, there's a time and a place for all that detail, and that's in due diligence. Don't get bogged down in all the intricacies of how your technology works until it's asked for or until the due diligence process. Um, keep it higher level, at least during your pitch, until it's asked for, and practice. Um, I don't know if you do pick, pitch practices through this program, but um, we have some entrepreneurs who could put on a clinic with their, their pitches. I mean, they get in there and they can drop the mic and walk out of the room and <laughs> just collect checks. Um, and then we have some <laughs> that don't. What are the names um, <laughs> numbers? <laughs> uh, I will tell you one of the best, well, Gabe Lozano of Locker Dome does oh, a great yeah. pitch and uh, Tom Pernikoff of TuneSpeak. His pitch is a thing of art. Um, and I think he, he would, it's a music technology play, um, so I think he would really like to drop the mic and watch out, walk out, but he hasn't done it yet. 
Um, and then we have some that it's, it's hard. It's not natural. It's not natural to stand in front of people and then have them tear your, um, your, your company, your baby apart. So practice, um, take criticism, and just continue to work on your pitch and, and hopefully get better. Um, so common mistakes that I see companies make when they go to try and take money. Um, taking too much money. It sounds really great to say that I'm raising a $4 million round because what couldn't you do with $4 million? I mean, that sounds great. But if you think about it, I mean, you are giving away equity in your company. And if your company is only worth $5 million and you're raising $4 million, you've essentially given away half of your company because the post money valuation of your company is $9 million. Really quick, time out. We were talking earlier. I don't know if any of you know who Brad Feld is. Does anybody know who Brad Feld is? He's awesome. Um, he is an entrepreneur out of, um, he's a venture capitalist and entrepreneur out of Boulder. But he has, Google this when you get home, he's got Startup Math. Um, it's, it's a website that you should just basically bookmark. It talks about what pre-money is, what post-money is, how to calculate share price, how to calculate how much dilution you'll have. Um, it just makes all these really complicated topics really easy to digest. So Brad Feld, and I think it's like valuation math or startup math. It'll really help you. Um, so anyway, don't take too much money. Set, what we like to see is um, what will it take, what's the amount of money for you to get to your next big milestone, huge milestone? What does that take? Put a little bit more runway onto it. You know, give yourselves a couple more months of runway beyond that milestone. Um, and raise that amount of money, and then come back and raise another round of funding once you've hit that milestone. Because then, once you've hit that milestone, you can raise at a higher valuation, and you don't dilute yourself as much. Um, so again, setting your initial valuation too high, it sounds much cooler to say I'm a $10 million company than a $5 million company. But the problem is, is if you go to raise your next round of investment, and you set your valuation at $10 million, but nobody wants to pay for your next round at $12 million, then you're screwed and you have to do a down round and your old investors aren't going to be happy and you're not going to be happy because you're going to get way diluted and the value of your previous investment is gone. Um, so you might have to do a $7 million round or a $5 million round. And it doesn't matter all that much because you're not exiting at that point, but down the road, um, the dilution that sits in it's just not a good thing. So be realistic in your valuation. Um, we look at industry multiples a lot when we, when we raise um, rounds. And so we like to see what other companies in that industry are getting um, for the amount of money that they're taking. So whatever the key performance indicators in that industry are, if it's average users who visit a site or um, average time on a site, whatever the multiples are, we look at that a lot. So at least be cognizant of that. Um, I talked about choosing the wrong investors. This is a dating process. You're going to be in bed together for five, ten years. Hopefully shorter, but realistically <laughs> five, ten years. And so if it's a bad relationship, it's going to be painful for a long time. So realize that um, personalities matter, um, priorities matter, making sure that you can work together matters, and keeping each other happy matters. I think one of the best ways to keep that relationship good is um, honest and uh, often reporting. So we have a couple of companies that send us quarterly reports on their own that are really well put together. They go through all their KPIs. They go through all their management highlights. That makes us feel good um, because we know that you're tracking that. We know that you're being honest with us. You know, We do as much as we can um, to track where you are. but. If you can provide us with updates, that helps a lot. Um, get a good lawyer. I don't know if, if you all get legal help or services through this program. Um, if you do, use it. Have someone look over term sheets. Don't use your uncle. You, I mean, unless your uncle is a really good startup attorney. Um, I think one of the biggest things we run into is that People think that they can get a discount by using their cousin Lou as their uh, attorney, even though he does you know, marriage law. Um, but he could paper the deal for them. Well, the problem is, is cousin Lou's going to do it wrong. 
and then you're going to have to hire somebody else to redo it, and you're going to spend a lot more money. So just get somebody who knows the space well and, and use that lawyer in the first place. And a lot of law firms, especially here in town, will give you discounts um, for startups um, because they, they hope that you're the next Twitter or Square, and they would like you to use them when you are the next Twitter and Square. I think one of the things, um, if you can, as you're modeling out where you think your company will go, and, and this doesn't have to be a, a sophisticated model of you know, discounted cash flows and projections and revenue and growth, um, trying to understand what it would take to get to your next milestone. So if that's having 100 paying customers, what are the rough costs associated to getting to those 100 co customers? And then at 100 customers, if you raise money, uh, what it takes to get to your next round of funding um, and what those next milestones are. If you can have that kind of jotted down on the back of an envelope, at least knowing where you're going, it could be wrong, it could change, but at least you have a blueprint of where you should be going and what that should look like. Um, and then that'll help in communicating that with investors and trying to raise money. Does anybody have any questions? I think that's my last slide. Nope, okay. Um, my, that's my email address. Feel free to email me. Um, good luck. And go to Startup Connection, it's really incredible. Um, it's an awesome night.